Amen. Man, it's great to be here tonight. I appreciate everybody who came out. I know a lot of people drove from really far away. I got to talk to a lot of people before the service that came from three, four hours away, and some people even further than that. I really appreciate you driving all the way out here to come and be with us tonight. And uh, also, it's great to see a lot of people that I already knew, as well as meet some new people. That yearbook is pretty cool. I got that. I got to look at that over there before the service, and I. That nobody told me anything about it. I just walked up to the table and I looked at like two pages of it. And I was like, this is great. I was thinking, I wonder if they have an extra one that they would be willing to give me because I really would love to take this home. And then I flipped it over and said, to Pastor Anderson. I was like, yes. So I really appreciate uh, those who put that together and uh, that you had a copy for me. Hebrews chapter two, the part that I want to focus on is beginning in verse number one, where the Bible reads, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. We need to give the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Sometimes even the most fundamental doctrines or the doctrines that we take for granted and that we just assume that we would never be shaken on these things, we need to give the more earnest heed to those things and make sure that they don't slip. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 to write the same things to you. To me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. You know, it's always better to be safe and preach a little too much on doctrine, a little too much emphasis on the fundamentals than not enough. And then they begin to slip. That's right. Now, the title of my sermon tonight is this, Slipping into Oneness Heresy. <laughs> Slipping into oneness heresy we want to give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard we don't want them to slip you say well pastor anderson i'm saved i'm a baptist i'm not going to become this oneness believer i'm not going to deny the very trinity well amen to that amen. the holy spirit's inside you but i'll tell you this though there are some people that even though we know they're not going to go off the deep end into that goofball oneness doctrine, though, they can still let the Trinity slip a little bit and maybe start to get a little mixed up on it or start to think, well, you know, that oneness crowd, they are kind of making some good points or, well, I kind of see where they're coming from. You know, let's just tighten it up tonight, shall we? Amen. Why don't we just take the wrench of God's word and let's just tighten this thing up tonight because we don't want it to slip later, okay? Yeah. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Since we're in Hebrews anyway, I'm going to make 10 points tonight. 10 points tonight tr proving to you that the Trinity is a Bible doctrine and that this oneness doctrine is a lie. Now, what does the Trinity teach? The Trinity teaches that God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, meaning that he's always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and he always will exist as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and these three persons make up one God. And that is the traditional view on the Trinity. That's what all Baptists have always believed. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. And I'm going to prove to you tonight that that's a Bible doctrine. Okay. Now, the oneness crowd, what they teach is that there's just one person, one spirit, who just manifests himself in three different ways or three different modes. This is also known as the Jesus only movement because of the fact that they say, well, the name of the Father is Jesus or the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus and it's just Jesus in another form, another mode, another way of talking about the same person. So let's start out in Hebrews chapter five and we're gonna see is the Trinity right or is the oneness doctrine, right? We already know the answer, but let's confirm it in the word of God tonight, lest it slip. Hebrews chapter five, verse four, the Bible says, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son today, have I begotten thee? And what we see very clearly in this passage is that Christ 
did not make himself a high priest. Christ did not glorify himself to be made a high priest. The Bible says it was the one who said to him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Now, anyone can see from this verse that that was someone else that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. If that was just Jesus saying that to himself, you know, it was just Jesus in a different mode or wearing a different hat, then this would make no sense. And you know what it would mean? It would mean Jesus glorified himself. And it would mean that he made himself a high priest. That's a lie. It was God the Father who made Jesus a high priest. It was God the Father who glorified Jesus. And the Father is not the same person as the Son. It's someone else. You say, well, you're teaching multiple gods. No, there's one God made up of three persons. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost make up one God. No man taketh this honor unto himself. Think about how disingenuous it would be if it was the same person. What if I got up tonight and said, you know, hey, I didn't ordain myself. I didn't make myself the pastor. I didn't invite myself to preach tonight. I mean, think about it. Did I invite myself here, Brother Romero? Who invited me? You did, right? Okay. So what if I got up and said, hey, I didn't invite myself. But it turns out, you know, Stephen Anderson, the husband, invited Stephen Anderson, the pastor, to come preach. It was just me operating in different modes. And that's what modalism is. It's basically saying that sort of like on the Andy Griffith show where the guy said to Andy Griffith, he said, you know, I want to talk to the judge. I want to talk to the mayor. And, you know, Andy Griffith, like, takes off his sheriff hat and puts on a, a or he puts on a judge's gown and says, all right, come talk to the judge now or something. <laughs> Maybe I'm remembering that wrong. Maybe it was a totally different show. It might not have even been Andy Griffith. But there's some kind of a black and white show where something like that happened, where some guy's like, oh, now I'm the fire chief, now I'm the mayor, now I'm the policeman. You know, it's just the same person he manifests as the Father, he manifests as the Son, he manifests as the Holy Ghost, then this would be a fraud when he says, well, you know, I didn't glorify myself. I didn't make myself. Yeah, you a lie. The Trinity explains this. Go, if you would, to John chapter 7. We're going to spend most of the sermon in the book of John. I love the book of John because it's the most basic book in the Bible. That's what I love about it. And I never get tired of reading it. It is my number one favorite book. My favorite part of the Bible is the four God people who like to bring a lot of glory to themselves and brag and, and you know, Jesus wasn't like that. He didn't glorify himself. Right? He was being glorified by someone else, God the Father. Look at John chapter 7, verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now, what kind of sense would that make if he sent himself? If he is God the Father and he just sends himself. Well, my doctrine's not mine. Oh, just kidding. Actually, it is mine. <laughs> my doctrine's not mine, but his that sent me. Who sent him? God the Father. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. You see, if Jesus is the truth, if there's no unrighteousness in Jesus, if his doctrine is a true doctrine, then he must not have been speaking of himself. He must have been speaking the doctrine that God the Father gave him. Because that's what this scripture clearly states. Go, if you would, to John chapter 8. Just one page over. John 8, 49, Jesus answered, I have not a devil. But I honor my father and ye do dishonor me and I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. The beginning of verse 50 is clear. I seek not my own glory. That's what Jesus said. So let's go to the third point. Flip over to John chapter 5. Point one, Jesus Christ did not seek his own glory. Point number two, Jesus Christ did not make himself a high priest. The Father made him a high priest. Point number three, the Son can do nothing of himself. 
He can't do anything of himself. You say, what kind of a crazy statement? You know what it is? It's a biblical statement. Yeah. And the problem is that in our Baptist churches for the past few decades, we haven't taught this stuff enough. We haven't emphasized this stuff enough. We haven't made statements like this from the pulpit enough. And then this doctrine of the Trinity starts to slip. We don't want to slip on this doctrine. We want to tighten it up. What does the Bible say in John chapter 5, verse 18? Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now look, we know that Jesus is God tonight, amen? amen. We've been hammering that from every Baptist pulpit for decades, as long as I've been alive. We've been hearing that over and over again. And we know that Jesus Christ is, is equal with God. The Bible says in Philippians 2, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? That means that just as much as God the Father is God, Jesus is just as much God. He's not less God-like. or No, there's one God. Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Holy Ghost is God. You say, oh, that's three God. No, no, because these three are one. There's one God existing in three persons. And the Bible says in verse 19, right after it said that he made himself equal with God, and we can go to Philippians 2 to confirm that, that he's equal with God. The Bible says in verse 19, then answered Jesus and said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself. He said he can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son Likewise, look at verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing, just in case you didn't get it the first time. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now, if he is God the Father, then he's doing what? He's seeking his own will. But he said, no, I'm not seeking my own will. I'm seeking the will of the Father. Now, the guy that we threw out of our church the ringleader of this oneness heresy that was creeping in, Tyler Baker. You all know him. If not, open the yearbook and check it out. But anyway, uh, he flat out said, well, I reject the three persons because persons implies different wills. Yep. You got it right, buddy. Amen. It does imply different wills. Like when Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. Like when he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Like when he said right here in front of your very eyes in John 5, 30, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which had sent me. Uh, that's different wills there. There's the will of the Son and there's the will of the Father. So number three, the Son can do nothing of himself. But point number four, Christ did not bear witness of himself. Look at verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Another way of saying that is that if oneness or modalism is the truth, then Jesus is a liar. They're making Jesus into a liar. Why? Because if he bears witness of himself, his witness is not true. And these modalists, what do they say? He's seated at the right hand of himself. He's praying to himself. He sent himself and he bears witness of himself. Okay, well, he's not true. And he lied. And you know what? God can't lie. Jesus Christ can't lie. Everything he said was the truth. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so if he bears witness of himself, it's not true. There's another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Who's he talking about? God the Father. Look at verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish... The same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Now look, Jesus Christ is standing there talking to them. Oh, you've never heard the voice of the Father. Then how can he be the Father? He's saying you've never heard it. I, well, you've never seen his shape. They're looking at his shape. Right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, folks, to believe in this oneness thing. Number four was that Christ did not bear witness of himself. If he did, he said, my witness is not true. Look at 
John chapter 7, verse 28. Let's look at the fifth point. Jesus did not send himself. He did not send himself. You say, this is a basic sermon. This is too basic. <laughs> but you know what? Let's tighten it up. John 7, verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me and me. Is that what he said? <laughs> you know both of me. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? He said, You both know me and you know whence I am. And I'm not come of myself, but he that sent me is true whom ye know not but i know him for i am from him and he hath sent me Amen. so did he send himself no he said he sent me the father look at chapter 8 verse 16. john chapter 8 16 we're on point five you're like we're making good time yeah but i'm gonna go through some stuff after i'm done with these 10 points <laughs> so don't get too you're like man we're, we're trucking along that dessert's gonna be coming soon all right we're on point five. Jesus didn't send himself. Chapter 8, verse 16. And yet if I judge, my judgment's true, for I'm not alone. Because it's me, myself, and I. Is that what he's saying? Is that the Trinity? Me, myself, and I? No. He said, I'm not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. Verse 17. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true he say oh, i don't i don't think two persons is biblical <laughs> he said two men isn't men another word for you know and it, you say well that's not about god that's the illustration yeah the illustrations of two men and he's comparing him and the father to what to two men that's the comparison why is that comparison being made well because if just one person testifies to something we might just think he's making it up one guy comes at us with an accusation and we say, come on. Is there any other evidence? Is there any other witness? How do I know that this guy isn't just making things up because he's got a bone to pick with that guy? So in the law, we need two witnesses. You know, it's funny, my brother had jury duty. So my brother goes into jury duty and when you get called in for jury duty, they have this process called vor dire. And this is where they pick who's going to be on the jury. And they want to weed out jurors who've been tainted. Maybe they've seen stuff on the news that could influence them. Or maybe they're just an incompetent juror. They don't understand justice. You don't want to just put a bunch of bozos in the, in the jury box and just, you know, somebody's life is on the line or somebody's freedom is on the line. You want to make sure that these people understand what they're doing, right? So my brother goes into the vor dire process and the attorneys begin to ask the potential jurors questions to figure out whether they are a competent juror. And the guy asked my brother, he said, are you willing to convict someone on just the testimony of one person alone? You know, if there's no other evidence and there's just one person's testimony and it's a really believable testimony, and I mean, this guy's a very credible witness, would you be able to convict based on that one witness? This is what the prosecutor asked. And you know what he said? No. Because he said, the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And he was immediately sent home. He was immediately deleted from the jury for standing on the biblical principle. No, I'm not just gonna take one person's word for it. And he even said, he said, you know, if there was another piece of physical evidence, I would take that as a second witness. If there was, you know, a video recording or a photograph or audio, you know, that could be a second witness. But he said, there ha there's gonna have to be two witnesses because that's what the Bible says. And that just kind of shows you what our justice system is like, amen? That's why we shouldn't go to law with our brothers before the unjust. We should go before the saints because even somebody with just a basic knowledge of the Bible knows two or three witnesses, right? So he says, well, it's written in your law. He's not talking to Sacramento, California, because apparently it's not written in their law. They'll send you home if you believe that. But he's saying to the Jews, talking about the Old Testament, it's written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I'm one that bear witness of myself 
And the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If you'd known me, ye should have known my father also. Now, imagine my brother going into that courtroom and let's say they'd not eliminated him. Let's say he made it into the jury, right? And the prosecutor says, well, you know, I remember in the voir dire, this guy said he wants two witnesses. So here's what we're going to do. And it was one lady's testimony that they wanted him to believe. What we're going to do is we're going to bring this lady in on two different days. She's going to wear different clothes and she's going to be in two different modes. <laughs> right? So, she, you know, we're going to bring her in once as a friend of the family and we're going to bring her in once as the cousin. So we got the cousin and the relative, or, or the cousin and the friend, right? And she's going to test. You think my brother would have said, well, yeah, it's two witnesses. I mean, you think any courtroom in the world would say, oh, well, Pastor Anderson, the father, you know, because I'm a father, right? I've got 10 children. I'll, I'll say I'm a father. So <laughs> Pastor Anderson, the father, and then the next day we're going to have Pastor Anderson, the son. Because I'm the son of Raymond Anderson. You think any courtroom? That would be laughed out of any courtroom. They'd say, "That's Your Honor, I object. They'd say, objection, Your Honor. We've already heard from this witness. He's already been cross-examined. No, 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 it's a new witness. Different mode. It would be laughed out of the courtroom. And this ought to be laughed out of every church in America. This nonsense. Go to verse 53 and let's get on to point six. Jesus did not honor himself. Jesus did not honor himself. Look at John 8, 53. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. Let me ask you something. Do you believe that the honor of Jesus is something? I do. I mean, to him be all honor, right? Amen. Honor and glory and majesty and praise belong unto him. Amen? Amen. But you know, he said, well, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he's your God. You know, how disingenuous would it be if all along Jesus really is the father, right? Jesus is God the father, come down in another manifestation or another form, how disingenuous to be. Well, I, I didn't send myself. Have you ever seen where somebody says that they didn't do something and you didn't even accuse them of it? Like you walk into a house and a kid's like, I didn't take the cookies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they, it's like, whoa, you know, I didn't even know that any cookies had been taken. Okay, so now imagine Jesus in the book of John just going around. It's like he just keeps saying over and over again, I didn't send myself. I'm not honoring myself. I'm not glorifying myself. And then he really did? Can you imagine how weird that would be to just go around saying that when he didn't? I didn't do that. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. What kind of a weird thing would that be? No, the truth of the matter is he's being accused of if you read the story, the Pharisees are saying, you're bearing record of yourself. And he's saying, no, I'm not. He's telling the truth. If modalism were true, Jesus would be like a kid with his hand in the cookie jar, just lying every chapter. And they make a liar out of Jesus Christ with this false doctrine. Look, the Bible is true. And he, if he says, I didn't do it, he didn't do it. If he says, I didn't honor myself, I'm not glorifying myself, I didn't send myself. Look, you either believe that or you don't, friend. What does the Bible say in verse number 55? Ye, yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. You say, well, I think your preaching's too abrasive. Well, you know, Jesus got a little abrasive with these false teachers. He said, well, you know what? If I said I don't know him, I'll be a liar like you. Isn't that what he said? But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and, I, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, 
Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, what did Jesus mean by that when he said, Before Abraham was, I am? He's saying, I didn't come into existence in Bethlehem's manger. It doesn't matter that I'm only 33 years old because before Abraham was, I am. It would make sense from a human perspective to say, before Abraham was, I was. But he switches verb tenses. Before Abraham was, I am. Why? That I am is showing his eternal nature of having no beginning, no ending, just dwelling in eternity. And he's applying that to himself. He's saying, I am. Now, we also know that that term, I am, is synonymous with Jehovah. Because in the Old Testament, when he's told at the burning bush the name of the Lord, it is, I am that I am. Tell them that I am hath sent you. And he reveals the name of Jehovah, which is equivalent to I am that I am. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Jesus is Jehovah? Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Why? Because the name Jehovah is applied to God in general. The Father is Jehovah. The Son is Jehovah. The Holy Spirit is Jehovah. Why? Because Jehovah is an all-encompassing term for the entire Godhead. The Lord. There are a lot of names that are shared between the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Let me give an example. My dad and I, we share a name. That name is Anderson. His name is Anderson, and my name is Anderson. And if somebody said of my dad, this is Brother Anderson, they'd be telling the truth. If someone said that I'm Brother Anderson, they're telling the truth. My daughter, Anna, here tonight, she has that same name, Anderson. Now, does that make us the same person? No. Now, what about the name Stephen? My dad doesn't have that name. Stephen is a name that I do not share with my dad. I do not share with my daughter, Anna, although we do share the name Anderson. Well, it's the same thing with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There are certain names that are shared. They can all be called God. I would answer to Anderson. She would answer to Anderson. My dad would answer to Anderson. You know, and all of the members of the Godhead are called God. You know, unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That name, Lord is applied to all of the three. But here's a name that is not shared, Jesus. See, the name Jesus is exclusively for the Son. Yes, Amen. And that's why if you actually look up the term God the Father in the Bible, it occurs 12 times. And I, I went into detail on this last night, so I'm not gonna re, or I'm sorry, Wednesday night. I'm not gonna re-preach Wednesday night sermon that I did back home. But if you look up all 12 mentions of God the Father, it's a contrast being made between God the Father and Jesus Christ. So the Bible says, for example, I'll just give you one example. You know, from God the Father, it says in 2 John cha cha chapter 1, the only chapter there is, verse 3, he said, grace be with you and mercy and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. The Son of the Father. Okay, so Jesus is always in contrast with God the Father. There's God the Father and then there's Jesus. You know, that wouldn't make any sense if the Father's name were Jesus. It'd be like if you said, well, there's Brother Anderson. Now, bro isn't Brother Anderson a term that could go for either me or my dad? Yeah. My dad goes to Verity Baptist Church, so people know him there, and he's Brother Anderson over there. So if they said, greetings unto you from Brother Anderson and from Stephen. Now, that right there makes sense. And what if somebody said that 12 different times? Greetings from Brother Anderson and from Stephen Anderson. Or greetings from Brother Anderson and from Brother Stephen. Okay. What kind of a person would walk away and say, oh, well, they're both named Stephen and they're both named Anderson? You'd be so confused. You'd be like, well, who's who? What would even be the point? You just say, well, just greetings from both of the Andersons. No, but you're making a point. Hey, there's Brother Anderson, and then there's Stephen, who's the son of Brother Anderson. Brother Anderson's son, Stephen. You see how that works?
But that would make absolutely no sense if my dad's name were Steven. To make that distinction 12 times would be meaningless at that point. So yeah, there are some shared names for the Godhead. God Almighty. The Lord. Jehovah. Th th that could be applied to the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost. But the name of Jesus is the name of the Son. That's, right. That's the name of the Son of God. And you got to believe on that name of the Son of God in order to be saved, Amen. according to the Bible. Because those who are not saved have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's right. And that name's Jesus. Okay, so let's go to the seventh point. Go to John chapter 3. Point number seven is that the Father loves the Son. Now, this is not self-love. This isn't, man, I really love myself when I'm in that mode. You know, you know, when I get into preaching mode, I love myself. Man, I love myself as a husband. I love myself as a father. You'd say, what is wrong with this guy? What kind of a narcissistic, right? What kind of a self-absorbed kind of a guy? You know, no, no, no. The father loves the son. And, and in fact... This is the model for love because God is love. God is the source of love. God is love and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God, right? So God is our perfect example of love. So the way that God the Father loves God the Son, it's an example of great love, isn't it? What does it say in John 3, 34? For he whom God hath sent... And if you get the context, it's talking about Jesus. He whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. So Jesus was given the Spirit without measure. That's all three persons of the Godhead, by the way. You have the Father giving the Spirit to the Son without measure. Look at verse 35. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Flip over to chapter 5, verse 20. We're going to look at chapters 5, 10, and 15 back to back. Look at chapter 5, verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. You can go straight to John 15 if you need to, verse 9, but I'm going to read John 10, 17. Therefore doth my Father love me. I mean, what if I stood up here and said, you know what? Stephen Anderson loves me. <laughs> I'm talking about Stephen the pastor now. I'm not talking about Stephen the father now. It, what? Why would you, what kind of sense would that make for Brother Fannin to get up here and say, Adam Fannin loves me? Say, wow, that's a great love. Let me learn about that example of love. But if the father is someone else, if there's a distinction of father and son and Holy Ghost, three persons, one God, it makes perfect sense at that point that it's the father loving the son. Chapter 10, verse 17, Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Look at chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I kept my own commandments. Is that what it says? In the modalist version, it says that, right? <laughs> Even as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Let's go to point 8, John 12. John chapter 12, verse 49. This is going to be point 8 here. Jesus did not speak of Himself. Now let me just stop here for a moment and help you understand the preposition of here. Because sometimes in the Bible, and sometimes in our vernacular, of means about, right? So if we talked about someone speaking of themselves, we could mean they're talking about themselves, right? But this is not what is meant here. A lot of times the word of is referring to the source of something, okay? Where they're from. That's what it means, of, is where it's coming from, okay? So what does the Bible say here in John 12, 49? 
For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. So what if I got up here tonight and I said, you know, I'm not preaching this sermon of myself. Brother Romero, you know, wrote my whole outline and he gave me a commandment of what I should say and what I should speak. Right? That would mean what? I'm not speaking of myself. It would mean that I'm basically just getting up here and executing a sermon that was written for me from Brother Romero and I'm just getting up here and just executing it. Now that's not the case. All right, I wrote this sermon all by myself, all right? And Brother Romero didn't even tell me to preach on the Trinity. You know what's funny is that I was already scheduled to come preach on this day several months ago. And I was going to preach on something different, most likely. But in light of the last few weeks, you know, this became the obvious subject that needed to be covered and needed to be preached and needed to be hammered down. But that's what it means to speak of. But what if I got up and said, I'm not speaking of myself, and I wrote the sermon? It's like, what? Yeah, of course you're speaking of yourself. The Father had sent me, verse 49. He gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Look at John 14. John 14, verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He doeth the works. Look at verse 2. Uh, 13 of chapter 16 go to John 16 verse 13 and we'll be in point 9 the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself now we've spent most of the night tonight talking about the Father and the Son you say hey let's talk about the Holy Ghost let's bring him into the equation right well the Holy Ghost point 9 the Holy Ghost does not speak of himself look at verse number 13 how be it when he the Spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Just yet another scripture talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, how they work together, how they operate together, how they are a team. They work together as a team. The Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay? These three are one. And the last point here on these ten points is also in chapter 16, verse 27. The point is that Jesus came from the Father. Jesus came from the Father. John 16, 27. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. That's a great statement, isn't it? I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So are you getting the picture here? Christ didn't seek his own glory. Christ didn't make himself a high priest. The Son can do nothing of himself. Christ did not bear witness of himself. Jesus did not send himself. Jesus did not honor himself. The Father loves the Son. Jesus did not speak of himself. The Holy Ghost does not speak of himself. Jesus came from the Father. Jesus is going to the Father. He always does the things that please the Father. He received a commandment from the Father, what he should say and what he should speak. He had his own will distinct from that of the Father's, and he submitted his will unto the Father's will. He didn't pray to himself. He prayed to the Father. He didn't forsake himself. The Father forsook the Son. And we can go on and on and on. This is not some obscure doctrine where we have to go to some obscure book of the Bible that I have to tell you how to find it because it's buried deep with, you know, Micah and Jonah and Amos. And, you know, uh, we don't have to go to the minor prophet. We don't have to sit there and search for this. We don't have to pull a few proof texts out of context. I mean, we can just read the book of John and it's from verse one. It's jumping off the page at us. Yes. 
I mean, verse one, there, verse two, there it is again. Verse three, it's like, uh, you know, this modalism doctrine is just getting nailed. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, you know, verse 14. And it's just, it's everywhere. And then it's just like every chapter. I mean, how, look how much scripture we just looked at. Verse after verse after verse. You know what? None of these verses are true if oneness is true. None of them make any sense if oneness is true. But they all fit like a glove with the Trinity. Which proves that the Trinity is biblical. Now, let's dig into what exactly does this oneness Pentecostalism teach? What does it teach? What, it, what, what do they teach? What's their doctrine? And let's see if it jives with what, what we've learned from the Bible. Now, these heretics that are starting this church here in Jacksonville, and this is right in your backyard, folks, for those of you who don't know the story. But there's a guy named Tyler Baker. He was thrown out of his church, fired for being a heretic, rejected of his church, rejected of this congregation here that now makes up Steadfast Baptist Jacksonville. Amen. Amen. And he was, the only person he could find to ordain him was his dad. So I guess, you know, he ordained himself, right? Because, you know, him and the father, I guess, are the same person. So, you know, he goes back to Kentucky and goes to a church that's just filled with all his relatives. Oh, poor baby, you got fired, you're called a heretic, we'll ordain you. The same church that he himself, out of his own mouth, called, quote, a bunch of stinking losers. But then he used them, even though he finds them to be losers, which is a mean thing to say about the people who raised you and supposedly won you to Christ and supposedly taught you the Bible. But he, he said that thing about them, and then he goes and uses them and so now he's coming to Jacksonville to start a church. And you say, well, I, I don't think you should call out other preachers and everything. Well, you know what? All throughout the Bible, that's what they did. You read the New Testament, he's calling out Hymenaeus, Hermogenes, Phygelus, Alexander, Diotrephes. I mean, all kinds of people that they're warning about. And the Apostle Paul said that these enemies of the cross of Christ in Philippians 3, he said, I've told you about them often. So it wasn't like once a year he preached against a false prophet. He said, I've told you about them often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And so this guy that's coming to start this church, he was fired and thrown out of his local church for believing in this oneness doctrine. He was going around secretly teaching people that the name of God the Father is Jesus and he was telling them how when I baptize people, you know, and he explained a Jesus-only type baptism where he said, well, I'm going to say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost because he didn't want to freak people out. So he was going to say the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and that name is Jesus. Eh, that name is not Jesus. Okay, so anyway, that's what he is going to be doing later this month. But now all of a sudden he's saying, well, it's not oneness what I believe in. It's not modalism. So he rejects the Trinity, but it's supposedly not oneness. So my question was, well, then what is it? Is it a brand new doctrine? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess for the last couple thousand years, we didn't know who God was. We didn't know who Jesus was until Tyler came along to bring in the true doctrine of Tylertarianism. I'm going to stick with Trinitarianism. I'm not going to mess with Tylertarianism. Now, let's look at what the oneness Pentecostals believe. Let's look at what Tyler believes. And then let's look at what the Trinity teaches. And let's just see what the facts are. We already saw what the Bible says. And it's a case closed. But what does oneness Pentecostalism teach? Well, with the advent of the internet, it's pretty easy to answer this question. Sure. You know, the internet just makes so much information available. Thankfully, we didn't have to go knock on the door of a church that's called like Acts 238 Miracle Church to try to figure out. We didn't have to preach, you know, we didn't have to go to like cloven tongues of fire, Pentecostal assembly of Yahweh to figure out what they believe. We were able to just go online and there's all kinds of videos. There's all kinds of information. There are even whole books. P people sent me whole books of PDFs written by these oneness Pentecostals. So it's no mystery what they believe. And since there are 25 million of them, 
since since 25% of of Pentecostals in America are oneness, 75% are Trinitarian, it's not hard to figure out what a oneness Pentecostal believes. Now, I personally have spoken to many of them at the door. And when you knock on their door, because I ran into this a lot in Sacramento and a lot in Phoenix, when you knock on the door, you can identify them right away because all they want to talk about is either they'll take you to Acts 2.38 and they want to be there, or they want to be in Matthew 28.19, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they have like a grammatical English failure where they say like, what's that name? You know, they understand that in the name of means on account of representing by the authority of. They think it's like a name, singular, because they fail grammatically there. Or what you'll have them say is, well, how were you baptized? They'll, they'll quiz you. You know, you're trying to talk to them about salvation. They're like, well, I have a question. How were you baptized? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Or in the name of Jesus? And you're like, well, if I was baptized in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it sounds like Jesus is covered, amen? Because yeah. Jesus is the Son. Covered it. Have you been baptized in Jesus' name? Yes, I have. Because I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Plus, I got two other name ofs that you didn't get when you got baptized. <laughs> but who's run into a Mount Soul winning? Put up your hand if you've run into a Mount Soul winning, the Oneness Pentecostals. Yeah. And I know that a lot of the people who came back from the Jamaica trip, they said, oh man, it's big over there. We were talking to a lot of oneness Pentecostals. I said, did any of them get saved? They said, none of them. They said, none. Of, and remember, that Jamaica was like the most receptive place to go soul winning on the planet. But they didn't get any oneness Pentecostals saved. Why? Because these are usually some of the hardest people to reach with the gospel. They're super into work salvation. They're super into losing your salvation, baptismal regeneration. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not even saved. I mean... They're real big on that stuff. And so it's super hard to get them to even listen to the plan of salvation, let alone to get saved. It's a wicked religion, folks. It's far, far from the kingdom of God. Now, we're not saying that Tyler Baker is a Pentecostal. You know, as far as I know, he's not rolling in the aisles or anything like that. So that's not what we're saying. But we're saying that his view of God and the Godhead and who Christ is, is identical to that of the one is Pentecostal view of who God is. And our point is, well, if no one saved believes in this, it's only these demoniacs that you're going to see in that DVD that was handed out earlier. And some of these one is Pentecostals appear in that DVD flopping around at one point. Then you have to ask yourself, why do all these demoniacs believe in it? And nobody else who's say, nobody who's got the Holy Spirit in them believes in this junk. So what do the oneness Pentecostals teach? Because they're saying, oh, we're not oneness, we're not modalists, quit calling us that. Okay, we're Tylertarian. But listen to this. Here's from Wikipedia. And don't talk trash about Wikipedia, okay? You know what? You know what's at the bottom of Wikipedia? You know what's at the bottom? All the footnotes and all the sources, and you can verify everything that's there. Okay, and plus this jives with everything on YouTube and all the PDFs and, and websites that I've seen on Oneness Pentecostalism. This is accurate. This is the second paragraph from the Oneness Pentecostalism Wikipedia page. Oneness Pentecostalism derives its distinctive name from its teaching on the Godhead, which is popularly referred to as the Oneness Doctrine. This doctrine states that there's one God. Amen. Yeah. We believe that part, right? A singular divine spirit who manifests himself in many ways, including as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So one singular spirit who just manifests in different ways. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. This stands in sharp contrast to the doctrine of three distinct and eternal persons posited by the Trinity. Yeah. Wikipedia is saying, hey, there's a pretty big difference between the oneness view of God and the Trinity view of God. You say, isn't it just a small difference? Isn't it just a, a semantic? Well, yep. Wikipedia said it's a sharp contrast, and I agree. Yeah. It's pretty different. Yes. He said it's real different than the Trinitarian position of three distinct and eternal persons. 
oneness believers baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, commonly referred to as Jesus name baptism, rather than using the Trinitarian formula. So when this article is just trying to give us a, a brief synopsis, what are the two things they bring up? They say, hey, look, you want to just know what oneness is in a nutshell? Here's what it is. It's rejecting the Trinity and baptizing in Jesus' name only. Those are like the two things that they brought out. Did everybody hear what I read? I mean, it's right. Isn't it? Did I did I read something other than that? Those are the two big things. It's like, hey, they don't believe in the three persons. They believe in a singular spirit, and they believe that uh, you know it's a oneness baptism of a Jesus only baptism. Okay, so now let's type in the word modalism because they're like, don't call us modalist. Here's modalism, Wikipedia, paragraph number one. Modalism is the non-Trinitarian or anti-Trinitarian belief that the Heavenly Father, Resurrected Son, and Holy Spirit are three different modes or aspects of one monadic God as perceived by the believer rather than three distinct persons within the Godhead. And that no real or substantial differences among the three so that there's no substantial identity for the Spirit or the Son, meaning that the, the, the Father has the same identity as the Spirit and the Son. They're the same person. That's what they believe. Now, the difference between the ancient modalism, because modalism was an ancient heresy from around the 3rd, 4th century AD, the ancient heresy of modalism said that these three modes were consecutive. So it was like he was the Father in the Old Testament. He was the Son in the Gospels. And then he's the Holy Spirit from the book of Acts until now. So it was like a consecutive modes, like Father, then Son, then Holy Spirit. The difference with the modern Oneness Pentecostal view is that according to the Oneness Pentecostalism, which began in 1913, a lot of bad things started in 1913, but that's another story. Federal Reserve, anyone? But anyway, you know, they said, hey, it's simultaneous. He's all three modes at the same time. Now, Tyler Baker and friends get up and say, well, we believe he's all three modes at the same time, so we're not modalist. That's the modern form of modalism. That's that, you know, we're not talking about 1700 years ago. We're talking about the current oneness view of Pentecostals. Okay, listen to this. This is from the Wikipedia page for oneness Pentecostalism. Advocating a non-traditional view of God Oneness Pentecostals find in modalistic monarchianism of the 4th century a historical predecessor. So basically when the Oneness Pentecostals want to say, hey, we didn't make this up in 1913, what do they point to for a predecessor? They say, hey, there were people who believed it back in the 4th century. And they point to the old modalism. Why? Because the old modalism, it says in this article, affirmed the two central aspects of their own convictions. Number one, that there's one indivisible God with no distinction of persons in God's eternal essence. And two, Jesus Christ is the manifestation, human personification, or incarnation of the one God. The oneness doctrine differs from Sabellianism, which is the old version, and that they conceive of the tri-manifestation of God as simultaneous instead of successive, as is the case with classical modalism. Now, isn't that what I just said? Okay. So, what is Tyler teaching? Well, if we just get the teachings from Tyler's own mouth in the video that he uploaded to YouTube, and I even just condensed the, the worst of it into a four-minute clip on YouTube called oneness heresy from Tyler's own mouth. So you don't have to watch the whole 75 minutes, although you can, of his video. And I didn't include all the crying and stuff, so you'll miss that part. But but I, I put a four minute video that boils it down, you know, to, hey, here's the proof. Here's what you'll find even in the four minute, you know, greatest hits reel, or the, the, the highlights reel. You'll find him saying that the son is the father, the Holy Ghost is the Son. The Father is the Son. They all are each other. That's what oneness Pentecostals be. Where's that shirt? I put, it in the car. I put mine in the car too. All right. We're not going to be able to. I was going to hold up the shirt. But anyway. 
So he clearly states that, well, no, the Son is God the Father. And God the Father is the Holy Spirit. So well, he, they're all the same person. He says that in the video, number one. Number two, he says in that video, God was praying to himself. And then he said, Jesus is up in heaven, seated at the right hand of Jesus. And he said, Jesus is seated next to himself. Number three, he says that the name of God the Father is Jesus. And number four, he talks about Jesus' only baptism. He says that, you know, the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, it's all Jesus, so I'm going to baptize in the name of Jesus because that's what that name is of all three. So he has all of the central components. Now, I'm sure he can find some oneness Pentecostal that disagrees with his view because of the fact that there are hundreds of oneness Pentecostal denominations. I mean, there are more varieties of oneness Pentecostals than there are varieties of Baptists. I mean, think about Baptists. We got Independent Baptists. We got General Association of Regular Baptists. We got North American Baptists. We got Southern Baptists. We got Independent Baptists. So we have all these different types of Baptists, right? But don't they all have certain things in common? Here's one thing they have in common. They all believe in the Trinity. Every one of those types of Baptists I just mentioned, they all believe in the Trinity. 18,000 Southern Baptist churches all believe in the Trinity. 9,000 Independent Baptist churches in America all believe in the Trinity. GARB, the Trinity. North American Baptist Convention, the Trinity. Right? They all believe in the Trinity. They all would say that the Scripture is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. They're all going to baptize by immersion. Right? Even the most liberal Baptist church is still going to dunk people underwater. I mean, there's certain things that kind of just go for all Baptists, right? And then there are other things like King James Version only that would only be specific to certain types of Baptist church. Well, look, oneness Pentecostalism is the same way. Some of them bark like a dog and others go bark, bark like a chicken. But the point is, they're all speaking in tongues. They all believe in baptismal regeneration. They all believe in the same oneness doctrine. And if they don't believe in the oneness doctrine, then they're not a oneness Pentecostal. So the point is that oneness Pentecostals agree on certain things. Jesus only baptism and the oneness of God. Okay, well, guess what? I just read for you from the Wikipedia pages articulating these views and they're exactly what Tyler said. You can see him say it in even four minutes. He has the hallmark. You know, Brother Joe mentioned that his wife grew up oneness Pentecostal and when she heard about this, Joe was a little bit confused, but she was like, whoa, I know what this is. I've heard about this. And she said, call him back. She said, call Tyler on the phone and just ask him one thing. How's he going to baptize? Because you know what? That is the trademark of oneness Pentecostalism. That's how you identify it. Then if you go to the statement of faith of this new church that doesn't exist yet, but hopefully it never exists. Amen. Hopefully it's like an untimely birth of a woman that doesn't see the sun. Okay. But anyway, if you go to the statement of faith of Valley and Baptist Church, it says... We believe God has a triune nature. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. We reject the teaching that God is three persons, one essence. So right in his statement of faith, he says, we reject the teaching that God is three persons, one essence. Well, you know what? That's what the Trinity is. So he's saying we reject the Trinity. But he words it in a way to where some people it might go over their head if they're not really up on this doctrine. If they're just kind of stumbling upon his website looking for a fundamental Baptist church. So, in his video he said, Jesus only baptism. On the statement of faith he said, we reject three persons, one essence. He has both of the central tenets. Both of the two pillars of oneness Pentecostalism. Also, and this is not in his video, but this was stated by him and Rick Martinez, one of his modalist buddies, that they believe that in the Old Testament, that there was a time in the past when Jesus was not the Son of God. That he didn't used to be the Son of God. And that in the future, he will someday stop being the Son of God again. 
Okay, whereas what do we believe as Trinitarians? We believe that God eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In the beginning, he was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. At the end of the world, he's still going to be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And we have proof that he was the Son in the Old Testament in Daniel 3.25, but only if you're reading a King James Bible. Because in the King James Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in that fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar says, we only threw three men in there, but I see four men in the fire, and they're loose, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. Jesus was the fourth man in the fire. Amen. Jesus was the fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, it's the Son of God. You know what the new versions change that to? A son of the gods. Plural. A son of the gods. That's a pretty big difference, huh? And of course, there's plenty of other proof that Jesus was the son of God. Even in the Old Testament, there are other scriptures that reference him as the son. Proverbs 30, verse 4 is a good one. You know, what is his name and what is his son's name? Talking about who is the creator and so forth. And I'm not going to go into all that right now because I want to stop and explain to you that this word three persons is biblical. This term three persons. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Now, a lot of this debate comes down to this word, three persons. Did you notice that? All the articles on oneness Pentecostalism, they brought that out. Hey, we reject three persons. Tyler's statement of faith says, we reject three persons. This is a major point here that we need to cover. Now, what does the Trinity teach? If you look up Trinity in Wikipedia, here's what it says. The Trinity is the Christian doctrine that holds that God is three consubstantial persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it started out right away saying what? The Trinity teaches that God's three persons. One God in three divine persons, the three persons are distinct, yet are one essence. In this context, a nature is what one is, whereas a person is who one is. Now, what was the word that Tyler used? Oh, we believe I have a triune nature. But we don't believe in three persons, one essence. Well, this right here says that the Trinity is three persons that are distinct yet one essence. And it's, it's not the nature. It's not what one is. It's a person is who one is, right? Meaning that these are three different who's. The Father is a who. Who sent Jesus? The Father. Who, who loves Jesus? The Father. The Father. You know, uh, I'm not going to re-go through my 10 points. But anyway, the opposing view is referred to as non-Trinitarianism, right? Okay, you say, well, that's Wikipedia, I don't trust it. Okay, how about Merriam-Webster's Dictionary? Trinity, noun, the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as three persons in one Godhead, according to Christian dogma. Okay, Random House Dictionary also called the Blessed Trinity or Holy Trinity, the union of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in one Godhead. Collins English Dictionary, also called Holy Trinity, Blessed Trinity, the union of three persons, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost in one Godhead. The New Dictionary of Cultural Literacy, a doctrine of Christianity that there's one God and three divine persons in the one God, the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. On and on. So, I mean, that's what the dictionary says. It's what the encyclopedia says. That's what the commonly accepted view of what the Trinity means. So saying, well, I believe in the Trinity, but I reject three persons. That's like saying, well, I believe in the Bible. I just reject Genesis through Revelation. <laughs> it's like saying, well, I believe in America. I just reject the 50 states. And how many times have you had people say, I believe the Bible, and then you show them stuff in the Bible, and they're like, well, I don't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> what, do you believe the Bible? Yeah. Okay, well, here's what's, well, I don't believe that. <laughs> All right, I can't even count how many times, right? So that's like, well, I, we, we, we believe in the Trinity. They want to redefine the Trinity. Yeah. They want to completely turn this doctrine on its head 
and lie and say, oh, it's just a different take on the Trinity. No, it's a rejection of the Trinity is what it is. Now, here's the thing. In the past, I sometimes shied away from the term three persons. And the reason why is because when I would bring that up to Muslims and people like that, they'd kind of freak out when they heard three persons and they'd say, oh, it's three different gods. And I'm like, well, no, they'd say it's like three separate gods. And I'm like, no, no, no. You know, and I'd explain it. So sometimes I would avoid that terminology when I was dealing with Muslims and so forth. Sort of like when you knock on a Jehovah's Witness door and you know they're a Jehovah's Witness. I don't say, do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven because it just derails the conversation. Because right away, they're just like, well, I don't want to go to heaven. That's for the 144,000. And then you're like, oh, man, you know. And then it's like, so that's why when I knock on a door, if I know they're a Jehovah's Witness, I say, if you died today, do you know for sure you have eternal life? Do you know for sure you're saved? That way I can get into the gospel without just them getting me derailed. So for the same reason, I sometimes shied away from the three persons term because I didn't think that three persons was actually like a biblical term. I believed in the concept. I agreed with the concept of three persons, of course, but I didn't always use that wording to explain it. But what's interesting is that I've since realized that actually that term three persons is actually a perfect description because it's actually biblical. Amen. Like not only does it express what we want to express, it's actually even biblical because some words are good words to express but it doesn't make them biblical, right? Like, for example, the word faggot. You know, like, I, sorry, I just had to get that out there. But anyway, because I know some people, they come to hear me preach. I've had people come up to me and be like, Pastor, are you going soft? Because you haven't said the word faggot in like three months. And I'm just like, I'm like, what are you talking about? I said it like a month ago. Give me a break. But, the, you know, but here's the thing. Like, a lot of people say, don't use that word because it's not in the Bible. They say, just use the Bible's word, sodomite. But the problem is, I knew a guy who sat through an entire sermon against the sodomites, and at the end of an hour of preaching, he walked up and he asked my dad, what's a sodomite? So he, was, he missed the whole sermon. The whole sermon was like, Whoosh. So he didn't even know what a sodomite was. So, so here's the thing about it. You know, if we use words that are easy to be understood, then we're not speaking into the air, right? You know, except we utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, we speak in the air. So sometimes we use words that are not in the Bible because they help us understand things. Now we shouldn't use like big words that are confusing because that doesn't help anybody understand anything, right? But sometimes a clear word like, hey, you know, the fags, you know, then it's like, oh, okay, now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Whereas sodomite could go over somebody's head. See what I'm saying? So look, even though the word Trinity is not used in the Bible as such, it's still a good word because you, you say it and it's like, okay, it gets my point across right away. People know what I'm talking about. Well, that's how I kind of used to feel about three persons. Like three persons gets the point across and it's correct, but it's not really the way the Bible words it. So therefore, if I'm talking to a Muslim, I would avoid it sometimes. I kind of, you know, but here's the thing about that. I've since realized that actually three persons is biblical and it's right here in Hebrews chapter one. Look at Hebrews chapter one, verse one. It says in Hebrews 1, 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, watch this, and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So what is the Bible saying here? The Bible is saying here that the, that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the express image of the Father's person. Now, if the Father has a person distinct from the Son, who is not the same person, but is the express image of his person, then right there, what do you have? Three persons, yeah. right? Because there's the person of the Father, the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Ghost. And then there's another verse that talks about uh, Paul forgiving someone in the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is a person. The Father is a person. And Jesus is the image of his person. Meaning his is what? Third person pronoun. 
You know, that's that third person, God the Father. And then you have Jesus. And obviously we know from other scriptures that the Holy Ghost is God. He's a person too. We get that. Personal pronouns, on and on. So the word persons is biblical. We, we shouldn't shy away from that term. We need to embrace that term. We need to speak in words that are clear. Now, in the past, we may not have known what a threat this was because we thought this was just for the holy rollers. So we were more focusing on debunking the Muslims, all 1.6 billion of them. And we were focused on debunking the Mormons of the Jehovah's Witnesses because we know that when we knock that door out soul winning, there's a pretty good chance that the Mormons of the Jehovah's Witnesses have already been by. So we got so focused on debunking that this Pentecostal oneness kind of creeped in through the back door. But you know what? As soon as we looked over and saw it, we went, no! I find out that somebody's believing or teaching this junk in my church, they're gone. Amen. They're gone. Just as much as if I had a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness creeping into the church and spreading that. And you know what? That's why... I fired Tyler Baker immediately when I found out that he believed in this. I didn't have to think about it. As soon as I found, as soon as, as soon, at first somebody started to explain it to me and the first couple sentences, I was, you know, I'm trying to like make excuses for him in my mind. You know what it is? I mean, if somebody tells you something bad about one of your friends, so the first couple sentences out of this person's mouth, I'm like making excuses for him in my mind. Maybe that's not what he meant. Maybe that's not what he's really saying. You know, maybe he's just a little off on the Trinity. Maybe we can just shore him up a little bit. And then it's like, oh, by the way, he's going to be doing a, a baptism. And they told me his baptism formula. And that's when I knew. That's when it clicked. Like, this is real. He actually is a oneness heretic. He was fired that day. Never, we never even regretted it or thought about it or revisited it. It's just, it's just like a, 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 a no-brainer yes. that this is a damnable heresy, that this is a denial of who God and Christ is. You say, oh, it's no big deal. It's a huge deal who Jesus is, who God is. It's a big deal. Now, let me give you a list. How am I doing on time? What time is it? Somebody help me out because I don't have a clock. It's just, uh, what's that? I've only been preaching for 15 minutes? All right, no, I'm just kidding. What, what time is it? 8.30. 8.30, all right. I'm, I'm getting real close to the end, all right. Give me like 15 minutes, all right. I've got a list here from Wikipedia. I clicked on that link that said non-Trinitarian. I got a list here of every single denomination that rejects the Trinity, okay? I want you to listen to this list very closely and tell me which of these groups you think is even close to being saved, okay? Everybody listening? Here's the list of non-Trinitarian churches according to Wikipedia in alphabetical order. The American Unitarian Conference, Arianism, Assemblies of Yahweh, a Jehovah's Witness spin-off called The Bible Students, started by Charles Taze Russell, Christadelphians, Christian Science, Latter-day Saints or Mormons, Church of God of the Abrahamic Faith, Dukabors, Friends of Man, Iglesia Ni Cristo, Israelite Church of God in Jesus Christ, Jehovah's Witnesses, Members Church of God International, Molokan, Monarchianism, Muggletonianism, <laughs> New Church, many members of the non-subscribing Presbyterian Church of Ireland, Oneness Pentecostals, the Polish Brethren, the Hicksite Quakers, the Samaritan Christians. Okay, yeah, and you know what? Art thou not a Samaritan and hath a devil? They said of Jesus, right? That when they lied about him. The Samaritan, and then how about this one? The Shakers. The Shakers. I don't know about you, but I don't know anything about the doctrine of the Shakers. But I can already tell there's something wrong with this religion. Because this is what they mean by Shakers. Woo! That's what they mean by Shakers. It's everything you're going to see in that DVD on Demon Possessed that was just handed out by Brother Romero and Brother Fannin. 
The Shakers. It's of the devil! Yeah. Did you know that the Jehovah's Witnesses are of the devil? Yeah. Did you know that the Mormons are of the devil? Yeah. Did you know that Christian science is of the devil? Yeah. Did you know that the Hicksites and the Shakers and Swedenborgianism and the Cooneyites and the Unification Church and the Unitarian Church and the Unitarian Universalist Church and the United Church of God and the Yahweh's assembly and Messiah and the Yahweh's assembly and Yeshua, they're all of the devil. Every single church on this list is of the devil. And none of them are even close to being saved. Who believes in the Trinity? Bap all Bap oh, I wasn't asked but raise your hands, but all Baptists. Baptists. Independent Baptists. And look, I know that the Southern Baptists are screwed up. But I've run into a ton of saved Southern Baptists. There are a lot of saved people who go to Southern Baptists. You know what? When I was a teenager, I spent a few months going to a Southern Baptist church. And I was saved. Okay. Look, there are saved people who go there, friend. There are saved people in all these Baptist denominations, even if they're watered down, even if their doctrines are a little off on things. Okay, and you know what? Calvary Chapel, I've run into a lot of saved people who go to Calvary Chapel. You know, now it kind of varies from, because we have a Calvary Chapel in Tempe. I don't think anybody's saved over there because we've knocked the doors all around there and when we run into people from there, they, they tell us it's all the wrong answers. They don't tell us it's by faith. They don't know for sure. They've got all the wrong answers of a workspace or you can lose it or whatever. But then there's another Calvary Chapel like four or five miles south of us where everybody I've ever run into from that Calvary Chapel, they're all saved. I ran the deacon from there. I talked to him for a few hours and he was saved. He, in fact, he, I talked to a guy from Calvary Chapel who was a deacon and he enjoyed my preaching. He said, hey, I know you. I've seen you, I love your preaching. And he said, our Calvary Chapel's King James. Now look, I'm not promoting Calvary Chapel. I'm not promoting the Southern Baptist. You know what? Even at the liberal fun center, there are a lot of saved people down at these non-denom fun centers. You know that? Independent Baptists are not the only ones that are saved. Independent Baptists are the ones who are doing the work of God and, and knocking doors hardcore and preaching hard and, and, you know, the tip of the spear. But there are people that are in these other denominations that are saved. You know, I've run into people that were Presbyterians that were saved. You know, a lot of these churches, they don't even teach a lot of doctrine. A lot of their members don't even know what their denomination even believes. There are people sitting in Presbyterian churches, Baptist churches, Calvary chapels, non-denom churches that are saved, and you run into them when you're out soul winning, don't you, where they give you the right answers and you can tell that they're genuine, they're quoting verses from the King James, they're quoting John 3, they know they're saved, they're happy to see you, you can have that kindred spirit with them right away. I mean, who's experienced that out soul winning, right? Okay, but you know what? You're not going to find that down at the Christian Science Reading Room. You're not going to find that in any of these other places. You go down to the Oneness Pentecostal Church, you will not find one person that's saved in that building. Yeah, not one. Not even one. Zilch. Zero. Nada. Yeah. Nobody on this list is even close to being an evangelical Christian. None. And all of evangelical Christianity confesses the Trinity. So, I, oh, I forgot one. I forgot one because I was reading them in uh, alphabetical order. So let me back up a little. Unitarian Universalism, United Church of God in Christ, Valiant Baptist Church, <laughs> Yahweh's Assembly in Messiah, Yahweh's Assembly in Yeshua. That's the new list. Somebody update Wikipedia. <laughs> Somebody sign in. So let me close by saying this. Do not end up at the trash can yes. of Steadfast Baptist Church. Now let me explain what I mean by this. Valley of Baptist Church, I, I'm predicting this, I can already see it now, this Tyler Baker Church, this, this Valley of Baptist Church is going to become your very own personal trash can. Now here's the thing, every great church has a trash can. I mean, think about it. Your house has a trash can. B businesses have a trash can. Right? What do I mean by the trash can? Well, you know what? Sometimes in church, 
We have to take out the trash. Yes. What do we mean by that? There are people that are reprobate. There are people that are rejected. There are people that are cast out of the church. There are people who are excommunicated or disciplined out of the church, thrown out of the church, right? And these people who are rejected of their local church, these uh, heretics in many cases, they're thrown out for being a heretic, like the people that we're talking about tonight that we threw out. Some people are thrown out for being a pervert. Some people are thrown out for... Uh, you know, any other number of, of reasons, drunkenness, fornicate. It doesn't mean necessarily that they're not saved. Many of them are unsaved, though. They're thrown out for being a homo. They're not saved. You know, if they're thrown out for being a, a, a modalist heretic. They're obviously not saved, you know, if they're all the way into this doctrine. And look, I understand that good people can get a little mixed up on the Trinity or they can get a little bit enticed by this. But when you've had eight months to repent of it and you've heard all the preaching and you've heard all the doctrine and you still believe in it, that's proof that you're not saved. Amen. Amen. You say, well, that's me tonight. Well, then I'm talking to you. If you can sit through this sermon and still believe in it, you're not saved. There, I said it. But here's the thing. We have a trash can in Phoenix, Arizona for Faithful Word Baptist Church. What I mean by that is every time we throw someone out, every time someone's kicked out of the church, or every time somebody gets really mad and disgruntled and Pastor Anderson, you know, is mean and he's a jerk and we don't like him, they all go to this church called 35th Avenue Baptist Church now. You know, we throw somebody out for being a pervert, that's where they ended up. Throw out the modalist heretics, that's where they ended up. People get disgruntled because they were trying to tell me about the flat earth and I tell them to shut up. I'm sick of the flat earth. I don't, I don't believe in it. It's dumb. That's where they end up. So it's like this trash can for Faithful Word Baptist Church. Well, here's the thing. I guarantee you that's what this new church is going to be right here. Every time somebody gets mad at Adam Fannin and gets mad at Donnie Romero, or gets mad about, you know, Pastor Anderson came to preach, and, you know, he's too mean, and what he made fun of me, or whatever. You know what? That's where they're going to go, Amen. to the trash. And then, you know, whenever you guys throw somebody out, they need to be actually disciplined from the church, or cut off from the church, or cast out of the church. That's where they're going to go, yeah, right. to the trash can. Yeah. Valiant trash can. Yes. Now, look, why don't you... Just decide right now that if that, God forbid, if that day ever comes that Brother Fannin steps on your toes or, or you get disgruntled and you get a root of bitterness and you're just like, I don't want to go to Steadfast anymore. Listen, why don't you just decide right now that if you get thrown out of the church or if you end up quitting the church and getting all upset and a burr under your saddle, why don't you just decide that you're going to go to another Bible-believing independent Baptist church instead? But don't go to the trash can! Why can't you just go to one of the other independent Baptist churches in this town? I mean, look, there are other soul-winning churches in this town! Don't get this weird attitude like we're the only ones soul winning. There are other church. Are, am I right, Brother Fanny? Are there any other fundamental Baptist churches in this city that go soul winning? Yes, sir. Yes, there are. Brother Romero, are there any other soul winning churches in the Dallas Fort Worth area? Yep. Yeah. Well, I can tell you right now, I can think of 10 in the Phoenix area independent fundamental Baptist church, soul winning church. Now, look, I'm not saying I want to go there. I want to go to Faithful Word, amen? amen? You want to go to Steadfast, amen? amen? But here's the thing. If you get all mad, why don't you at least go to a church that's doctrinally sound on the fundamentals? And you know what? I'd rather go to a church that's wrong on the rapture than wrong on who God is. I'd rather go to a church that's wrong on the Jews. I'd rather go to a church that has a, a Star of Rim fan flag than a church that doesn't even know who Jesus is denying the Son of God. You know what I mean? I'd rather they're wrong on the Jews. I'd rather that they're wrong on Bible prophecy. You know what? But they better be sound on the fundamentals of the faith. They better at least be a Baptist. They better not be on this list. 
This is like the list of the damned. It's a damnable hall of shame here. Everything from the American Unitarian Conference to the Yahweh's Assemblies of Yeshua, it's all garbage. Just go to another independent fundamental Baptist church. Don't throw yourself in the trash. Don't go to the trash. Don't be a garbage pail kid. Don't be a dumpster diver. Don't end up there. And you know what? You know why? You know why some people will be tempted to dive into that dumpster? Is because they're going to think of themselves, well, when I go there to the dumpster, they're going to kind of understand what I'm going through because they're the same way as me, a bitter, disgruntled former member. So we can all go there and talk about, yeah, you got, you got accused of, of being a heretic because you said everything on the Oneness Pentecostalism page. And, you know, well, I got, be, I got accused of being a sexual pervert because there were, you know, four witnesses and hard evidence, you know. Yeah, isn't it? You know, it's too bad, huh? And you know what? I, I heard, I even heard this, that you guys threw out somebody... For being a sodomite a few months ago, somebody get Tyler Baker a contact card. That's his first member. Tyler Baker needs to follow up. He's getting, you know, we, we throw out the trash, we throw them out, and then he says, Come on in, for thou art a valiant man. <laughs> oh, Adonijah will let you in. Adonijah will look at you and say, Come on in, faggot. Come on in, modalist. Come on in, heretic. Oh, you're. Flat Earth, come on in. And look, by the way, if you're a flat earther, you're welcome to come here. Just to, just shut up about it. <laughs> just shut up, right? You, you got sorry. Maybe I'm out of place for saying that. You agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, shut it. Yeah, you started it. That's right. Man, these these guys. I gotta say this. I, I'm done preaching tonight. This is I, I'm fellowshipping in the wrong place for a little. I'm supposed to be a few doors down. <laughs> you know, I love these guys. Pastor Donnie Romero, Brother Adam Fannin, and they're always like a little ahead of the curve on things. These guys are ahead of the game. I remember when Brother Romero first preached against the flat earth thing. And I remember thinking, what is he talking about? Like, why are you preaching about this? It was kind of weird, right? But that he was just ahead of his time. Because like six months later, it was everywhere. And it's like, whoa, Brother Romero, God. Adam Fannin, man, he jumped in there and he caught that Johnny Nixon thing. Remember that? He was the one, he tried to tell me about it. I'm like, nobody believes in that. What are you guys talking about down there at Steadfast? You know, where do you, where do you guys find this stuff? And then three months later, Bob Gray's promoting it. SM Davis is promoting it. I was like, whoa, these guys are ahead of the game. They're ahead, on, they're ahead of the curve. It's so funny. Today, you know, I went and bought some of that Trinity ice cream that Jersey Joe was, uh, or I guess now he's Jacksonville Joe, but that Jersey Joe was showing the Trinity. I, I went down there and brought, I brought it to Adam Fannin's house. You open his freezer, it's already there. Yeah. <laughs> he's always, he's always one step ahead of me. <laughs> Look, we know what the Bible says. Let's not move the ancient landmark that our fathers have set. Let's not move the goalpost. Let's not move the landmark. Now look, the Bible's our final authority, but we shouldn't just be hasty or quick to throw out, to throw out established doctrine believed by all Baptists and all evangelical Christians. You know, I mean, good night. That's a pretty serious thing. I mean, you better have concrete proof in the Bible. And what you actually find is the opposite you find a mountain of evidence for the Trinity. Stay with steadfast. Stay with the Trinity. And if you do end up having to part ways with Brother Fannin for whatever reason, or part ways with Brother Romero for whatever reason, if you have to part ways with us or our friends or, or other brothers and sisters in Christ, just don't ever part ways with the Trinity. Amen. Just stay with the Trinity. Don't slip into that oneness crowd. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and we thank you so much for making it clear 
especially in the book of John, Lord, the, the, the beloved book that we give to every babe in Christ to root them and establish them in the faith, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all these people. God bless them for driving three, four, five hours to be here. And, and those who are local, Lord, thank you so much for raising up a, a local assembly here to stand with this great group of soul-winning Christians, Lord. Bless our time of fellowship, Lord, and give us all safety as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.